As with Medica and the Women's Support Network, my main interest in Bachelor Law of the North, the research among them, was just how women so divided managed to share a political feminist project of action. These photos are very much like the ones in the poster. <coughs> Palestinians in Israel, we're not talking about the West Bank or Gaza, and the vigils standing together on the roadside, taking a lot of insult. the space between us. So what I was looking at was how do they cross that space okay. um, with words instead of bullets. That had been my question. So now, in 2012, I was setting out to ask them, what's happened to your peace process? What's happened to your cooperation, to your old dialogue? Well, I'm going to tell you a bit about what I found in each place. In Bosnia, I found Medica still there, but reduced in size. And it had lost its mixity. Today, it's almost entirely Bosnian, Muslim. The director now is Sabina Haskic, who I met in the old days as a religious counselor among the therapists. Also still there was another old friend, Karina Jenkins. She's now the senior nurse. And she's actually unique in today's medical because she's the only one who's of mixed origin and in a mixed marriage, something very typical of Bosnia in the old days. She said, I don't belong to any religious groups. I belong only to myself. <coughs> Nobody sees me as Bosniak, Croat, or so because I don't allow it. I celebrate every holiday in the calendar, Christian, Muslim, whatever, to be a good example to the children. It's not a person's name, but how they behave that matters. It's not that the other others, Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Croats, have been driven away from Medica. It's not that. It seems that it just happened. For lack of a positive recruitment policy, some of the women of Bosnian Serb and Bosnian Croat name had been doctors or psychotherapists who'd gone back to their old pre-war jobs in the hospitals. Or they'd moved on to similar work in other war zones, women's projects in Kosovo and in Afghanistan or something. Some had been busy raising families, or they'd fallen ill or retired. I did manage to find and interview 17 of my old friends from 1995. They told me the dominant reality in Bosnia has been and still is the terrible economic situation. And men, brutalized by the experiences of war, have come back to poverty and joblessness. That has been fertile ground for male violence. By the late 90s, the survivors of war rape had left Medica. But straight away, the center was needed as a refuge and therapy center for survivors of domestic violence and civilian rape. <coughs> Somehow, in the process of adaptation, the feminism of Medica changed. Medica had been brought into existence by a partnership of German women in Bosnia. Monica Hauser, Gabi Mishkovsky, and others had brought their Western feminism, and Yugoslavia had had its own feminist movement before the war. Their shared anger at the mass rapes fueled a transnational and anti-war feminism. Since the war, Responding to domestic violence, Medica's feminism has changed. It's become, very reasonably, actually, a combination of women's aid and women's rights feminism. On the one hand, they're providers running a secure refuge, 
And on the other hand, they lobby the government for laws to protect women. As international funding dried up, they accepted public funding, and this has been crucial. Now they have a close partnership with Zenit's local council. They share a resource in the social welfare department. Some of the former medical women tell me they feel that medical feminist autonomy has been compromised by this proximity to the state. Two women, Dushka Andrich and Selma Haji Khalilovic, who used to work in Medica's information department, it was called Infoteca. They've taken Infoteca out now. It's independent. They wanted to pursue a more outspoken feminism, which they feel is totally lacking and badly needed in contemporary Bosnia. Especially it's needed by a new generation of young women trapped between, on the one hand, a very commercialized and objectifying kind of Western culture, and on the other, Islamic fundamentalism, which is growing in their region because a lot of foreign Mujahideen fighters settled in Zenitsa after the war, and they opened madrasas. I found all of the women I re-interviewed totally angered by the nationalism of the post-war political culture in Bosnia. It is relentless. The Dayton Accord produced a bad design. It created a weak state made up of two rival entities, constitutionally ethnic, the Republika Srpska and the Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, which is subdivided into Bosnia and Muslim and Croat Catholic uh, territories areas. Rather than diminishing nationalist enmity, this arrangement fostered it and rewarded it. The leaders have just gone on blaming each other for wartime atrocities, instead of acknowledging guilt and practicing transitional justice. The one or two political parties that try to recruit from all names and work for inclusive democracy, the women told me, haven't a hope of winning elections. After the war, and I can't quite imagine how, they managed to unify the three armies into one army. Now there's talk of it splitting apart, and the most nationalist leaders on the Serb side are always threatening secession. Pass of pictures from the present day. Black and white for the past, color for the just the interviews, really, but those discussions which were helpful to me. Okay, to move on, over to the west in Northern Ireland. I was shocked to find the old mules of fighters in black balaclava, balaclava helmets, you know, with assault rifles that are still on the walls. In fact, there are some that have been newly painted. They haven't gone away with the piece. As well, I found a lot of Belfast neighborhoods are still divided by interfaces, those high fences, built to discourage raids into enemy territory. None of these so-called peace walls have been dismantled since the peace agreement, and I'm told that some have been built. Certain things are a lot better. The British Army isn't so much in your face today. They're hidden away somewhere, I think it's still there. But the real IRA won't accept the peace settlement, and there have been assassinations of security personnel. And you've probably been reading about the Royalist riots in the last few weeks. Um, about the decision of the Belfast City Hall not to fly the Union flag on every day of the year. So violence hasn't gone away. In Bosnia, militarized masculinity has been corralled into that unified army. 
In Northern Ireland, it's turned its weapons inwards. Loyalist gangs fight each other for control of the drugs trade. Rebel Republicans brutally punish young drug pushers in their own communities. And like in Bosnia, with high unemployment and low public investment in working class areas, unemployed and demoralized men take it out on their wives and partners. Rising domestic violence has been a feature of peace in Belfast as in Bosnia. I re-interviewed 13 of the women from my original study. I found two of them are still coordinators of those women's centers. Eleanor Jordan is still running the Windsor Women's Center in the deeply loyalist neighborhood called The Village. Gillian Gibson is coordinator of Footprints in Catholic Old Glass. They've been trying to keep the women's support network's practice of dialogue going by having a twinning arrangement between their two community centers. Um, so I asked them, is cross-community work like that any less risky now? for the women than it had been 15 years ago. Gillian said that it seems acceptable now to exchange staff between the two women's centers, but women users, the women actually living in these segregated streets, they still don't have much contact with each other. It's from the Protestant side mainly that the inhibition against contact comes. And it's not the choice of the women, it's the attitude of the men in these communities who still punish women who talk to the end. Eleanor told me that they would really welcome more contact with Footprints and with other Catholic centers. There is just a bit, but it has to be done in silence, she says. We don't advertise it. It's interesting that in Zenitsa in central Bosnia, the remaining Serbian Croat women did not report to me any constraint today on their contact with each other and with the Muslim majority. The nationalist hatred there is expressed in the political level between the parties and the entities. Here in Belfast, it's down at street level still. You still take care about crossing sectarian lines between neighborhoods. With the coming of peace, the Women's Support Network, of which Footprints and Windsor were once leading members, has lost its political edge, they tell me, what it used to call its frontline feminism. Like Medica, perhaps more so. It doesn't any longer challenge the politicians and the administration in the way it used to do. In those old days when it turned the state's community development program into what they called women's community empowerment. Reasonably enough, the women's centers have looked to the state to give them secure funding. And of course, they aren't going to bite the hand that feeds them. However, as in Bosnia, a few of the women have started a new feminist movement that they call Reclaim the Agenda, hoping to recover the radicalism that somehow got entangled in the management of post-war organizations, you know, organization On the positive side, I have to admit, Belfast today, apart from the murals and the fences, it does look somehow more like a European 21st century city. There are new developments like the Odyssey Arena, the Obel Tower, and the massive Titanic visitor center. And the city center, the place that you used to avoid, especially at night, because they closed gates around it and you had to climb over to get home. You know, it was a threatening kind of place. Now they say it feels more like common ground. There are lots of lively venues, art centers and bars, restaurants where people of all religions and politics feel okay. The young in particular may be mixing more. <coughs> Schools are still mostly segregated, but a recent survey showed that in spite of that, today's 16 year olds think about it, the 16 year olds are the generation that was born just after the ceasefires, okay, so they didn't know the fight. Um, they are just a bit more likely than their predecessors to cross the religious divide to make friends. Three years ago, one in three had no mates at all on the other side. Today, it's only one in five, but there's no the power sharing devolved government in Northern Ireland, which collapsed twice in the years after the agreement, has now held for six years. But an arrangement like that doesn't lend itself to a spontaneous kind of democracy. When all the negotiation is between two sides, defined by identity politics, you don't get a right-left dynamic. So there isn't the unified left opposition that a lot of these women would really like to vote for. On the other hand, the quality of the relationship between Sinn Féin and the Democratic Union as the party 
is a good side better than the relationship between positives and conflicting parties. And it certainly compares favorably with the situation in Israel, with the influence of the extreme right over Likud and the political representatives of the Palestinian minority never get anywhere near power. Some slides from Belfast. when I first went to spend time with the women of Bachelor Law, there was cautious optimism in the region. The Oslo Accords of 1993 were still holding. The Jewish white didn't like them, of course, and even some Palestinians condemned them as being co-opted too. But a lot of people on both sides believed still that they were on the way to peace. It no longer seemed totally subversive to advocate a Palestinian state alongside a Jewish state. The transfer of some administrative powers to the Palestinian Authority was going ahead. But just before I arrived there, Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister, had been assassinated by a Jewish settler. And there had been suicide bombed. So confidence was damaged. Back then, I had seen how the activist dialogue between the Jewish women and the Palestinian women in Bachelon up there in the Galilee, was a very unusual thing, calling for a lot of political imagination and care. Perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised to find when I went back in 2012, no bachelor at all. The hard work space between the women of the two communities had vanished into thin air. What happened was that first in 2006, the northern group split from the main organization in Jerusalem and changed its name to Bat Jafon, Daughter of the North. The split was mainly because the Northerners felt the Jerusalem women didn't pay enough attention to this, to this internal question, democracy for Israel's Muslim and Christian Arab minority. Then in 2008, the Northern group disbanded altogether. Two years later, the Jerusalem group also closed. I managed to locate eight or nine former Bat Jafon members in the Kibbutzim and in Nazareth and other Arab towns. We had a meeting. I tried uh, to uncover what had brought about the collapse of their group, and I interviewed them. So why? Well, there was simply the attrition of time, of course. We all grow older, we get tired, we get sick, and our activist energy falls away. But more than that, I could hear in their stories a gradual fading of hope. Whereas in Bosnia and Northern Ireland, the Accords had turned into something you could at least call post-conflict, even if you couldn't quite call it peace. <coughs> Here, on the contrary, the overt violence between the Israeli Defense Forces and Palestinians had escalated hugely over the decade. There was the Second Intifada in 2000, the renewed invasion of Lebanon in 2006, and the brutal bombardment of Gaza in 2008 and These have been full-scale acts of war, with casualties in thousands. Imposing the occupation itself also involved daily violence. The relentless
first militarized Jewish settlement of the West Bank had reduced and fragmented the area available for a Palestinian state. Such a thing was no longer geographically feasible. There was no longer a peace process to support. It was not only Bat Shalom that had faded in this period. The whole Israeli peace movement, the women told me, was in eclipse. The disillusionment and weariness that led women to withdraw from Bat Shalom had been felt most by the Jewish members. The intention of Bat Shalom of the North had always been to be an example to their home communities in the Kibbutzim, to draw more local women into the dialogue. Now, Jewish attitudes had hardened. The activists felt isolated on their Kibbutzim. They felt hated, even, for seeking contact with Arabs. Lack of funding had forced them to close their one-room office in Afula. They couldn't any longer pay full-time activists. On the other hand, the Palestinians were dismayed by the loss of their Jewish partners. They would have been prepared to keep going. Quite a few of them had also been active in Tandy, the left-wing movement of democratic women. And they still go on with that, and they keep up contact with those other Palestinians across the Greenland. Interestingly, though, in its last few years of life, the Northern Group had seen some positive developments. Already before the outbreak of the Intifada in 2000, they had started to work together on annual events to mark Land Day, Yom al Ar. It's a very important date in the Palestinian calendar because it marks the moment in 1976 of the first internal uprising against the theft of Palestinian land by the Israeli state. For these Jewish women of Bat Shafon to acknowledge this injustice and join Palestinians in organizing the land. Was a bold <laughs> it's not <as> falling. <laughs> yeah, and they did so. This getting involved in land day, doing land day, they did it specifically as women, as feminists, um, focusing on women's part in the land struggle, what had happened to them in that forty eight years. On land day this year, twenty twelve, I was in the Galilee again. I went to the big rally held by Palestinians in the Arab town of Sakhmin. There were thousands of women and men, girls and boys, with massed flags of Hadash and Balad. But there wasn't any longer a mixed group of Jewish and Palestinian women with whom I could go and mark the day. In their last years, some of the women of Bat Shafon had come to be among the few in Israel's peace community who dared to say openly that a two-state solution was no longer viable and to say the unsayable. The singular Jewish identity of Israel had to end. Bat Shafon's women had always been convinced that true democracy within Israel, an inclusive democracy with Christian and Muslim Arabs as equal citizens, is a necessary condition of a peace settlement in the region. Now they were ready to imagine a multicultural entity across the whole Israel-Palestine region, from the Lebanon and Syrian borders in the north to Egypt and the south and from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, a nation of Jews, Palestinians, and others in constitutional equality. But this vision was a personal vision. It only gelled among the few women remaining at that moment when Bat Shafon faded away from Bat Shafon's failure is symptomatic of the feminist peace movement in Israel more generally. At least this is what they've told me, right? Some of you may know better, but <clears throat> it had been an active member of the Coalition of Women for Peace, which for its part had often mobilized countrywide action against the occupation and in support of peace groups. Today, the coalition, I'm told, isn't really a coalition any longer. It's rather a single focus organization, mainly involved in research. It does do valuable research, and it has a project called Who Profits? It's about enterprises profiting from the occupation. Um, <coughs> women in Black which once counted 30 vigils around Israel, has shrunk to three, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and Haifa. Yes, there are feminist groups. There's Ishali Shah in Haifa, whose concerns span women's rights, equality, the sex industry, trafficking, and so on. And there's New Profile, a wonderful new profile, a feminist organization of women and men, which continues to support conscientious objectors, refuse to serve in the idea. But there is no successor project to batch of one of the North. There is no sustained and tested partnership of Jews and internal Palestinian women. 
Meanwhile, what there has been on the streets in the space once filled by a peace movement is protest in the style of Occupy. About 18 months ago, there were some huge demonstrations, <coughs> mainly middle class Jewish youth protesting against the growing gap between incomes and the cost of living. Okay, so my last slide show of time. Yes, so this one today. This one comes. Phases, as feminist students of war and peace processes have often pointed out, it gives some women scope for collective action that they lacked before. This was the case in Northern Ireland, where the oppression of living in districts beset by street level conflict sparked that defiant working class feminism. It happened in Bosnia, when foreign funding and feminist activists, appalled by the mass rapes, came to partner local women. And it had happened in Israel Palestine too. In the late 80s, when Jewish women were propelled into their own anti-occupation activism by witnessing the courage of Palestinian women, the other side of the Green Line, caught up in the Intifada. One form of active response to war seen in the three women's organizations I've described is an attempt to create and sustain a dialogue between women defined by the war makers as enemies. Those of us who theorized this as transversal politics described it as a creative crossing and redrawing of boundaries that mark significant politicized differences, a process that can, quote, on the one hand look for commonalities without being arrogantly universalist, and on the other affirm difference without <coughs> being transfixed by it. It's relational work that calls for empathy without sameness, shifting without tearing up your roots. But peace negotiations characteristically overlook women and their transversalist insights. Notwithstanding the scale of sexual violence in the Bosnian war, women's representatives and women's issues were totally absent from that airfield in Dayton, Ohio, where international notables sat down with the war criminal leaders in negotiations to end the fighting. But not a woman in sight. In the case of Israel-Palestine, there were no representatives of women at the table in the Oslo negotiations. Actually, even the interests of Israeli-Palestinians were not represented there, which shocks me. The internal minority. It wasn't too surprising then if it was an uphill struggle getting gender change as part of demobilization in these new administrations in the post-conflict years. However, Northern Ireland had been different. The Good Friday Peace Peace Agreement had been the outcome of a much more inclusive process in which women's experience had actually been listened to. As the very tense discussions went on between the political representatives of the British state and the warring parties, a movement in civil society fostered by the European Union had mobilized to contribute ordinary people's ideas about a future Northern Ireland. The Women's Support Network, in alliance with others in that vibrant women's community sector, 
and a women's political party, the Women's Coalition, and trade unionists, women trade unionists. They were able, very differently from how it was in Dayton or Oslo, to insert themselves on their agenda into the peace process. The result was an accord that wasn't merely a truce between fighters. It was a commitment to a fair and inclusive society with equality between Catholic and Protestant communities and equality between women and men and on seven other grounds besides. You may know Beatrix Campbell's book, Agreement. It's a wonderful and passionate book. I really recommend it. Um, she writes that the Good Friday Agreement was, quote, a dynamic exemplar of reformed democracy for the 21st century, embodying a transcendent duty to produce more than peace to begin the millennial work of transforming the sectarian and sexist power relations that structure society. On the other hand, now, a decade and a half later, the Belfast women tell me that the devolved state structures of Northern Ireland, in actual fact, are still failing to deliver on the equality's duty, as it's called. The idea had been to focus policy not on the two sides being nice to each other, coming together, but on putting right what was wrong with Northern Ireland. And a lot was wrong with Northern Ireland. Investing wholeheartedly in the poorest working class areas, that had been the intention. Catholic, but also Protestant, because there's Protestant poverty too. That itself would end sectarian hatred. That was the idea of the United Peace In fact, it was the only thing that could be responsible. But recession and lack of political will has derailed that intention. In Northern Ireland, as rioting happens again on the streets this month, women are still asking, as they are asking in Bosnia and Israel-Palestine, when is peace, actually? 